You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Taxi cab. Who needs a taxi? Over here. There's a cab. Tell him to wait, Wilfred. Quickly, before someone else gets it. Junior, come along. I'm coming. At least carry a mother's suitcase. Her shoulder's bothering her. I got it. Evening, folks. I got your bags. Can you take four? What's that? There are four of us. Sure. Three in the back seat, one in the front. Uh, where's Paula? Don't ask me. I thought she was with you. She's back there talking to somebody. Who? <laughs> Who? A guy. Who do you think? Paula, come over here right now. Yes, Daddy. Hey, can I get your number? Now, I said. I heard you. And who was that? Who's who? That young man you were talking to. A college boy in a fraternity. Come along, Paula. You can't go around talking to absolute strangers. Get in the cab. But he was nice. Oh, you think anything in trousers is nice. Ready, folks? Seems to be very busy tonight. Ah, uh, yes, sir. What's the occasion? Are you serious? Well, if I weren't, I wouldn't waste my breath. I asked you a simple question. Mardi Gras, sir. Oh, no, of all the wretched timing. Mardi Gras? Can we go, Daddy? Oh, please? We most certainly cannot. This is hardly a pleasure trip. What about me? You'll stay with us. But I'm old enough. Not another word, Junior. Come down on business, did you? That's right. Family business. My father-in-law is extremely ill. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, what's the address? 1427 Wistria Lane. Do you know where that is? Sure do. Uh, that's in the Garden District. Some nice places around there. There are indeed. And this is one of the nicest. A very valuable piece of property. I'll bet. Can I ask a question? Ask away, son. What's the drinking age in New Orleans? Junior! I just asked. Um, driver, how do you turn the light on back here? Now what in the world do you need a light for? So I can see myself in the mirror? I have to fix my hair. Will you all please try to control yourselves? No one wants to be here. That's understood. But now that we are, we'll just have to make the best of it. Step on it, driver. We don't have all night. Yes, sir. Um, put on your seatbelts, please. I know a shortcut. Otherwise, we'll never get there. They don't call it Fat Tuesday for nothing. Meet the Harpers. Not your typical American family, perhaps, but people who belong together, like birds of a feather. First, there's Wilfred Harper, father and husband a money-hungry, conniving sort with shifty, piggish eyes that reflect the contents of his soul. His wife, Emily, on the fading side of 45, with a petulant, mousy face and a voice to match, a thin-lipped hypochondriac. Then there's Wilfred Jr., with a face devoid of any suggestion of character. He has inherited much of his father's avarice and all of his mother's weakness. The combination gives him a half-hungry, half-cruel look that one usually finds on cornered animals. And his teenage sister, Paula, a vast desert with only one structure on it, a mirror. She is committed to her own appearance and nothing else on earth. These four received a phone call concerning the health of Emily's father, one Jason Foster, who lies dying in his mansion. Soon we'll meet Mr. Foster a tired ancient who on this particular evening will leave the earth. But before departing, he has a few things to do, some services to perform, some debts to pay, and some justice to mete out. Because this is not only New Orleans at Mardi Gras time, it's also the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Masks, starring Stan Freeberg with Stacy Keach as your narrator. How do, Nola? Jeffrey? Give you a hand with that? Oh, thank you kindly. Crowded downtown? Yeah, the biggest Mardi Gras ever. At least that's what it looks like. 
I almost couldn't get a seat on the streetcar. Got everything, I see. Everything he asked for. How is he? He looks badly. And he's much weaker. Ever so much weaker. Can't say as I'm surprised. He wants to be advised when his relations arrive. Knowing his relations, I'm sure they'll make themselves known. You're right about that. The doctor's still here? Mm-hmm. With him now. I'll get dinner started. You do that, Nola. You do that. Oh, my. A sad and mournful day. Yeah. Well, Sawbones, how's the pulse? How do you think? Too fast, too weak, too uneven? For what? What do you have in mind? Yeah. Where were you when they taught bedside manners in medical school? Trying out for the soccer team? Huh. I've been your physician, Jason, for, uh, how long is it now? Forty-two years. <laughs> First time I attended to you, it was for a head cold. I allowed myself one compassionate cluck, just one, and you threw a lamp at me. That established the pattern right then and there. Yeah, that's why I've suffered your inept ministrations all these years. Your candor has been a refreshing departure from the modern medical norm. I ask you a straight and simple question, and you give me a straight and simple response. <sighs> What is it, Jason? <clears throat> the oft-asked question of the condemned man. How long? Well, there's really no telling. How long have I, Sam? A week? A day and a half? Huh? Or is there no need to wind my watch to cover the exigencies of the next four hours? My guess is that you may now measure your life in moments. I think it could come at any time. That you've lasted this long, Jason, is a tribute to an inner strength most of us are not privileged to possess. Nonsense! It's a tribute to a streak of recalcitrant, cross-grained, unaccommodating orneriness. And the fact that there are one or two things left for me to do on this earth, that's why I must stay alive, at least until midnight. I hope I see you tomorrow. Doctor? I'm sure you shall. God willing. Right this way, please. Thank you, Jeffrey. And the hat box, Jeffrey, that blue thing. Yes, ma'am. Be particularly careful. It has all my medicines in it. Stand up straight, Junior. You'll get round shouldered. Why do you still call me Junior, Pop? I'm not a kid anymore. I could break you in half if I wanted to. Oh, such talk. Well, <laughs> couldn't I? Now, 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 let's watch our words. And you, Paula, behave like a young lady. All right, Paula. Hello, Emily. Oh, how nice to see you again, Dr. Thorne. You've met my husband. Yes, uh, some years ago, the last time he was here. How are you, Mr. Harper? As well as can be expected under the circumstances. And you, Mrs. Harper, how are you? Bearing up, Doctor, as best I can. This is our son, Wilford Jr., and our daughter, Paula. Hi. Hello. This is your grandfather's doctor, children. Your father's been expecting you. I'm very glad you could make it. Crowded at the airport, was it? Oh, that silly Mardi Gras. Well, really, the traffic is unspeakable. Shouting, screaming, incredibly rude people. It's a wonder we were able to get here at all. As for your father's condition, he's... Oh, yes. How is he? We're all really quite concerned on tenterhooks, you might say. Well, he's extremely ill. How long? Well, a good educated guess would be that it's just a matter of days. Days, you say? Hours, perhaps. Is that right? How simply awful. We've been expecting it, of course. Uh, Jeffrey? Yes, ma'am? Our rooms, are they ready? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they're all prepared. I want to take a shower. Wait for the butler to show the way. Uh, a question for you, doctor? Yes? You may recall, I suffer severe muscle spasms in my shoulder. They're really quite agonizing. Are they? Oh, perhaps you could prescribe something? That quack I've been going to in Boston is supposed to be a specialist, but... He'd better be a specialist. He charges like one. Well, it's a very complicated condition. As a matter of fact, he told me that you don't see cases like mine more than once or twice in a hundred years. Oh, please, Emily. It's true. 
Let me describe the symptoms. I'll be sitting down, perhaps reading a book, and I'll suddenly get this bolt of pain through my upper arm. It's all I can do to bear it. You can't imagine. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Harper. I have another call to make this evening. Uh, if you'll forgive me. Take the luggage upstairs, Jeffrey. All of it. Yes, sir, Mr. Harper. And this briefcase, too, if you will. I'll do my best. I'll see you to the door, Doctor. Paula, you and your brother see your mother to her room. Come on, Mom. Oh, give me your arm, Junior. You already got it. I hope you don't mind, darlings, but the pain is... Well, frankly, it's more than I can bear. This way, folks. Old man's in bad shape, huh? As I said, the old man is dying. And there's no chance of a recovery? Not realistically, if that's any comfort to you. Good evening, Mr. Harper. Father? Don't worry, I'm awake. Well, don't just stand there. You may as well come in, all of you. How are you, Emily? Bearing up, Father. Bearing up? Heh, you sound like Job, itemizing his calamities. What is your illness this month? Oh, never mind. I'll... I'll bully through. What are you doing there, Wilfred? Oh, just examining this piece of porcelain. Wedgwood, isn't it? Yes, and quite old. Say hello to your grandfather. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I see Paula has found the mirror. It's my hair. I can't do anything with it. You are four of the most changeless people on Earth. Do you realize that? Huh? Oh, I don't like being ill, if that's what you mean, Father. Don't you? Don't you indeed, Emily. Heh, <laughs> that's hard to believe. It really is. Why, what do you mean? Considering that in the past 25 years, you've been at death's door so many times, it's a wonder you haven't worn a hole in the mat. <laughs> and you, Wilfred, how's business? Oh, you know it is. Make a little, lose a little. It's a struggle, but I managed to keep my head above water somehow. Your head above water? Heh, that's a good one. <laughs> I think the only book you've ever read, Wilfred, is a ledger. If someone were to cut you open, they'd find a cash register in place of a heart, a profit and loss column instead of a spine, and liquid assets running through your veins instead of blood. Really, that's not fair. Really, it is. And you there, Paula, putting on a fresh coat of lipstick before speaking further, I see? Nice to see you, Grandpa. How friendly of you to say so, considering that you haven't looked at me yet. All you've seen is yourself in the mirror, which, in the final analysis, is all you ever see. That's not true. You're being mean, Grandpa. You shouldn't, you know. We've had such a miserable long trip, and Mother hasn't stopped complaining one instant. Oh, you hear that, Father? The younger generation. He jests at scars that never felt a wound. Emily, my dear, I understand that my troubles include hardening of the arteries and a weakening heart. But if you continue playing Sarah Bernhardt, I may well succumb to an intestinal affliction. What does that mean? It means you're in danger of making me sick to my stomach. And young Wilfred Jr. over there, looking as alert as usual. Willie, darling, tell Grandfather how nice it is to see him. It's very nice to see you, Grandfather. Looks like an English bull, talks like a parrot. How gracious and unselfish it was for you all to come and see me. Father, dear, wild horses couldn't have kept us from you. Not even my own agony. Well, I hope you survive, Emily. You're to have an excellent dinner this evening. And then I've planned a surprise. But, Grandpa, it's Mardi Gras. I was hoping you'd know of some parties. We're having a party here, Paula. We are? Have you invited any boys? Better than that. We'll have a marvelous time. I've arranged for us all to wear masks. Masks? How droll, Jason, masks. 
I swear you people don't just celebrate tradition down here. You succumb to it. I think you'll find that there's absolutely nothing traditional about them. Masks, huh? Well, it might be kind of fun. It shall be, my boy. It shall be. Eh, perhaps not the same degree of satisfaction you receive from torturing small animals as I've seen you do in the past. Oh, come on, Grandpa. I haven't done that in a long time. Willie is doing very well in school now, Father. He made the football team. A chip off the old block, I'm sure. <laughs> well, now, <clears throat> why don't you all prepare for dinner? I think we'll have an interesting evening. As a matter of fact, I guarantee it. As you wish. Will we see you downstairs? Uh, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Come, children, Emily. Everything all right, Mr. Foster? Jeffrey, get the masks and place them in the study, if you will. Those masks? Yes, those masks. You know the ones. Yes, sir. Hmm. A tremendously interesting evening for all. I promise. <laughs> away from the window, Paula. But look at all the fun they're having. You heard your father. I think it's disgraceful, the way those those animals have invaded this part of town. It used to be just in the quarter, but now... I want to go with them. Paula! Well, why not? The most exciting night of the year, and we're stuck in this... this mausoleum. The whole city is out there dancing, and what do we do? We have a death watch for a crazy old man. Cool it, sis. Close the window right now. There's a draft on my bursitis. Great. What did you do in New Orleans, Paula? Did you go to Mardi Gras? Oh, yeah. We wore funny masks and sat around and stared at each other. Look at those stupid things. Don't touch the masks. I'm sure they're very old and valuable. Everything in this house is valuable. They are if Father bothered to collect them. Without question. Look at the chandelier, the furniture, and the paintings. I've never asked you, Emily. Is that an actual Matisse in the hall? No, it's a Picasso. Oh, is that all? Here you are, Mr. Foster. Thank you, Jeffrey. That will be all. You sure, sir? I can take it from here. Yes, sir. Well, now, my loved ones, was your dinner satisfactory? Sumptuous, Jason. Really, truly excellent. Must have cost a pretty penny. Father, do you think it wise for you to be up like this? Wise? Probably not, but necessary, assuredly. Have you, uh, examined your masks? Our masks? <laughs> you must mean they're a gift. Uh, well, in that case, thank you. They're, they're certainly unique, Father. Indeed. They're made by an old Cajun. Actually, made is inaccurate. They're created, each one separately and individually. <laughs> Is that so? I'd be interested in any provenance you can provide. Their history, ritual meaning. You mean so you can resell them? No, of course not. I wouldn't worry about that just yet. We're simply curious. No doubt, no doubt. I'm told that not only are these works of artistic perfection, but they possess certain um, properties. Very unusual properties. Can I look at the magazine? No way, I'm reading it. Children, your grandfather is speaking. They're only worn during the Mardi Gras, and there's a ritual to the wearing. You see, one tries to pick a mask, which is the antithesis of the wearer. How so? Oh, for example, the ugly man might cloak himself in beauty, whereas the shy and retiring put on the facade of boldness. Youth wears age, and age, youth. You get the idea. In other words, it's a masquerade of opposites. Very interesting, oh. Now, why would anyone do that, Father? Why question it? This is a special evening. 
And now, dear ones, let's pick our appropriate masks, shall we? <laughs> If you say so. You, Wilfred, how do you fancy yourself? I don't understand. Come on, be candid. When you shave in the morning, who looks back at you? Why, I do, of course. I, I don't see... Please, <laughs> it's a crucial question. What do you see? Really, Jason, I think we're a little old for parlor games. Let me be the judge of that. Indulge an old man. Oh, all right. Give me a self-assessment. Come on, be honest. You're serious? Never more so. Well, I suppose you could say I'm good-natured. Congenial. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. I've always been a congenial man. No matter what the circumstances, I... Try to take things in stride. Very good, Wilfred. Congenial, friendly, outgoing, even extroverted. In short, amiable. I think so. So it follows that as part of this amiability, this general goodwill, you feel a deep rapport with your fellow man. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. Now, the opposite of your affability would be... Ah... This face, here. This one? Surely not. Look at it, Wilfred. Hold it in your hands. Feel the way the wood is carved. The angry, feral lines. The gnawing, rat-like teeth. The opposite of the way you see yourself, remember? Charming. I take your point. Hardly an appealing image, though. Live with it a while. Try it on. Come on. It has great subtlety. The features reflect greed, avarice, cruelty, like a predatory animal. In short, all the character traits that you don't have. An ironic choice, <laughs> wouldn't you say? Quite. And now, the brave lady on the couch. Oh, really, Father, I don't feel well. I'm not up to... Of course you are, my dear darling daughter. You're up to anything. Your courage dictates that you accommodate a relatively brief period of self-sacrifice. It should come naturally to you. How about this one? But it's hideous. Of course it is. Look at it closely, my dear. The face of a sad, sniveling, self-centered coward. Flabby and without character. Fearful eyes, no chin at all. In contrast to your own bravery... Your doughty, intrepid strength. Well, I suppose it does serve as a contrast. Next, the one over there who walks in beauty like the night. What? Pay attention. Your grandfather is speaking. If you want to know, I think this whole thing is a bore. Paula! Well, it's the truth. Wear this one, just for a short while. All right. But it's horrible. Ah, look closely. The round porcine features. It's the face of a pig with beady eyes, puffed out jowls, and a shiny pink snout. <laughs> a self-indulgent face that's never satisfied. Not like you, my dear. It has none of your heart. None of your selflessness. None of your... your great concern for others at the expense of yourself. Well, if you put it that way... And last but hardly least, the timid one over there, the gentle and quiet Wilfred Jr. Oh, come on, Grandfather. But you haven't seen it yet. Well, what's this one supposed to be? You're opposite, my boy. The face of a dull-witted, stupid clown. Thanks. Notice the low brow, the bulbous nose, the slack, oversized mouth, as opposed to your own manful refinement. Your courteous, deferential gentility. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. And now, we're almost done. What about your mask? This one. <laughs> but, but that's a skeleton. The face of death, because I'm alive. Understand? I'll wear the very thing that stalks me at this moment. Oh, you don't mean that we actually have to wear these hideous things. I believe I explained that. Only for a few hours, I should add. Until the unmasking. And that's at midnight. Paula, you'll break it. I don't care. Everybody else can do what they want. I'm not wearing mine. Then I'm not either. I'm afraid, Jason, that we're somewhat at odds here. 
Not really, Wilfred. The four of you came here for one purpose. To see me off and yell, Bon Voyage! To put coins on my closed eyelids. While with your free hands, you start grabbing and looting. Father, that's cruel. On the contrary, that's truth. You came here to reap everything I've sown, to collect everything I've built, to covet everything I possess. And I'll not disappoint you. The will is prepared. Everything is left to the four of you. Everything. Money, house, property, holdings, stocks and bonds. All of it. All of it. Jason, you break our hearts when you talk that way. The most touching thing you've ever dredged up, Wilfred, by way of conversation. But I must emphasize this little addendum. One small proviso. You're to wear those masks until exactly midnight. Not a moment more, not a moment less. What? I don't believe this. Really, Father? Mark my words, if you take them off, if you do, you'll each receive from my estate the equivalent of a ticket back to Boston. And that's it. That's it. That's absolutely, positively all. Never fear. We won't be spoil sports. If this is your pleasure, we'll indulge you. Quite happily, I might add. It's the least we can do. You're joking. It smells old and musty. Who knows where it's been? Here, Emily, let me help you fasten it to your head. But the germs... Don't be an idiot. Put on the miserable mask. Don't throw away a fortune because of your wretched hypochondria. Oh, all right, Jason, we're doing it, see? And now, I'm putting on mine. How do I look? Everyone. Oh, Paula, Willie, do as your father says. What do we do now? Dance, sing, or vote for the ugly prize? <laughs> you win, sis. Man, look at the stout on her. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And now, dear ones, it's my turn. Now let's all wait for the stroke of midnight. When all things will be revealed. <laughs> Evening, Jeffrey. Nola. How's Mr. Foster doing? He's up and around. He is? Mm hmm. In his electric wheelchair. I took him into the study. <laughs> that man. I reckon he wants to spend time with his relations. Well, they look like they don't want to spend time with him. Let me ask you something. What does he plan to do with those masks? I think he wants to play a game with them. With the masks? Or his people? <laughs> Beats me. He better be real careful. Why's that? He had me buy those masks down in the quarter. Wanted them made special by some witch man who does voodoo and such. I told him, Mr. Foster... Don't you go messing around with that stuff. That's the devil's work. Nola, he said, don't you worry. I know what I'm doing. I surely do hope he was right. Me too. Once you go that way, there's no turning back. That's the truth. Help me put away these dishes, Jeffrey. It's getting late. If you say so, Ma. <laughs> At least it's music. Don't you even have a stereo, Grandpa? Sorry to disappoint you, fair one. Well, this is a blast and a half. <laughs> I've already looked at every magazine, every creepy old antique. Not everything, Paula. There's no end of treasures in this room. Like what? These books, for example. Oh, they are. How rare. <sighs> Their first editions, aren't they, Jason? All of them. All of them. Imagine that. They must have taken you years to collect. A lifetime. Freud, Audubon, William James. Who is this? Lovecraft. 
I see his autograph in one. The Shadow over Innsmouth. Very rare. You should read it sometime. About people who aren't what they appear to be. Pretty valuable, I suppose. Extremely. Of course, not as valuable as the oils. Hey, you might be surprised. Although the paintings have been appraised at several million dollars. That much? <laughs> oh, father, is it close to twelve yet? <laughs> Patience, Emily. Good things come to those who wait. I can hardly breathe behind this mask. I'm suffocating. It won't be long now, I promise. Where's the TV? <laughs> you gotta have a TV. Sorry, no cartoons for you tonight. Oh, we don't need entertainment. Why would we? We're rocking out right here in this room. We're getting down, aren't we? Hey, having a ball. We're raising the roof. Party on, everybody. Let's play charades. Spin the bottle. Post office. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's... Oh, look what you've done. I couldn't help it. Just lost my head, I guess. It was an accident, okay? Oh, I'll clean it up. Eh, the maid will take care of it. But the value, it must be irreplaceable. Eh, not really. Just an early Ming Dynasty vase. Still plenty of them available. I'm taking this thing off my face. I can't stand it one more minute. Paula, don't be a fool. Oh, I don't blame her. I don't blame the child one bit. Nor do I. How could I? We each behave according to our natures. I told you it was an accident. This is cruel, Father. A cruel, heartless torture. I have to agree, Jason. Really, this has gone far enough. We've been in this room for three hours, regarding each other through these grotesque masks. There's a limit, and we've all reached it. I must tell you, as far as I'm concerned, this is nothing more nor less than madness. Junior, what are you doing? <laughs> I've had it too. I am not a bozo. <laughs> Oh, please, Father, please let us take them off. Jason, we're waiting. Speak to us. Have you all had your say now? Anything more from you, Paula, Junior, Emily, the flower of my loins? Or you, Wilfred, the benevolent captain of industry? Is there anything else you have to tell me? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Uh, only that I... I'm feeling buried alive. I agree with Dad. I think anybody who would do this is out of his mind. Please, Pop. <laughs> Let us take him off. I appeal to you, Jason, from the bottom of my heart, for the sake of my family, for all of our sakes. <sighs> <sighs> Open the window to the street for me, would you? One last time. If you like. Oh, but my first time is... Shut up, Emily. Ah, the sounds of the night. They come from far and wide to partake of pleasure. A joyous celebration of life. Unlike you, who are without joy. I don't think that's fair. Of course you don't, because you are the object of this particular jape. Listen to them out there. Do you hear whining? Complaining? Anger? I don't. I hear happiness. Simple pleasures. Food. Drink. The joy of being together. Of being alive. As if they know it's fleeting. Precious. But those of us in this room, we have a different agenda, don't we? And what of you? What do you get out of it? Satisfaction. A kind of grand culmination. Uh, 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 close the window. What is it? It's what you've been waiting for, I believe. The anointed time when you can all dig deep into the treasury. You're, you're feeling weaker, Father? Ah, at last. A note of hope in your voice, Emily. Why must 
you say such miserable, cruel things to me? To all of us. What have we ever done to you? Because you are a pitiful excuse for a family. That's why this is the only language you understand. Only we could respond in kind. If only we could open up to you without restraint in the same way you speak to us. If only we could tell you what we think of you. Fine, Wilfred. Excellent. <laughs> the truth at last. You've masked not only your faces, but your minds. Speak what's in you now. You're a twisted old man. Yes! Yes! Tell him, Daddy! You dangle us like puppets. You always have, taunting to get a response. You play with us as a cat does with mice. There is no humiliation you wouldn't subject us to. And for what reason? We've done everything you wanted, always. We've remained at your beck and call. Your slightest whim. <sighs> My whim? What have I ever asked you to do before tonight? You visit when you see fit and have nothing to say when you do. <laughs> well, we do now. We sure do. <laughs> You're a stinking old man. <laughs> That's what you are. And it's time you die. Past time. <laughs> Why don't you? <laughs> Even the clown has found his voice, huh? I agree with them. Do you hear me, Father? I agree. It's time you let go of your grip on us. My grip, indeed. I have no grip on you. I tried to hold you once, but none of you respond to love. You, Emily, you respond only to what your petty self-absorption dictates. That's enough, Jason. Wilfred responds only to things that have weight and bulk and value. He feels books with his hands. He doesn't read them. He appraises paintings. He doesn't seek out their truth or their beauty. And Paula there. Paula has lived her life lost in a mirror. The world is nothing to her but a reflection of herself and her brother. Humanity to him is a small animal caught in a trap to be tormented. His pleasure is the giving of pain, and from this he receives the same sense of fulfillment that most human beings get from a kiss or an embrace. <laughs> so unfair, Father. Your caricatures, all of you, even without the masks. And this last note. <laughs> I haven't held any of you here. You were always free to go. What's held you here has been my daughter's weakness. <laughs> My son-in-law's greed, my granddaughter's vanity, <coughs> and my grandson's cruel subhuman sadism. <coughs> as soon as the clock chimes twelve, you will all be very rich. It's as good as done. Now you own everything I have owned. You've kept your bargain. You've worn the masks. <coughs> So now enjoy yourselves, my pretties. Live full lives. And may God... May God have pity on you. <coughs> Father! I'll check his pulse. There is no pulse. At long last... He's dead. <laughs> so, what do we do now? What do you think we do? We take off the masks and celebrate. This nasty thing, it's stuck to my skin. My tooth! <laughs> Paul Jr., put your fingers under the chin and pull. Watch me. <clears throat> What's the matter with all of you? Your masks are off now. What's... Wilfred! Your face, Wilfred. It's not your face anymore. It looks just like the mask. What are you talking about? Look in the mirror and then look at me. No. It can't be. But it is. 
What are we going to do? She's right. He did this. <laughs> that old creep. If he weren't already dead, <laughs> I'd kill him. No. No. <laughs> Mr. Foster, are you all... Mr. Foster? Mr. Foster, sir! Call the doctor! Nola! Call him now! Where is he? In here. I called you right away, even though I... I knew. Strange mask. Like a death's head. Where are the others? In the room, sir. They practically ran upstairs. Oh, Jason, Jason. I'll take this mask off for you. You won't need it now, old friend. Would you just look at him? His face. So peaceful. Oh, Mr. Foster. Mr. Foster, sir. Don't cry for him, Jeffrey. This is his true face. Not a line on it. Not a care. No horror. No fear. Nothing but peace. I'll call the funeral home. This way, sir. Yes, uh, this is Dr. Sam Miller. I'm at the Foster home. Yes, that's right. Uh, Mr. Foster has passed away. Time of death, 12 midnight. All right, I'll fill out the death certificate. Someone will be here. His family. <laughs> Mardi Gras incident the dramatist personae being four people who came to celebrate it might be said that they partied with a vengeance they now wear the faces of all that was pent up inside them but unfortunately they'll wear it on the outside for the rest of their lives said lives to be lived from this point on in the shadows Tonight's tale of men, the macabre, and masks in a section of the Big Easy called The Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. The Masks, starring Stan Freebird with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Maggie Carney, Craig Brawley, Elizabeth Lado, Jeff Lupitan, Doug James, Kurt Nabig, Sarah Marks, and Carl Amari. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcheson, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. (laughs) 